War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Performed by Liam Knoll and arranged and introduced by Dalton Jones. Book One, The Coming of the Martians, Chapter One, The Eve of the War. No one would have believed in the years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own, that as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusuria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It is curious to recall some of the mental habits of those departed days, as most terrestrial men fancied that there might be other men upon Mars, perhaps inferior to themselves and ready to welcome a missionary enterprise. Yet across the gulf of space, minds that are to our minds as ours are to those of the beasts that perish Intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic regard this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. And early in the 20th century came the great disillusionment. The planet Mars, I scarcely need remind the reader, revolves around the sun at a mean distance of 140 million miles, and the light and heat it receives from the sun is barely half of that received by this world. It must be, if the nebular hypothesis has any truth, older than our world. And long before this earth ceased to be molten, life upon its surface must have begun its course. The fact it is scarcely one-seventh of the volume of the earth must have accelerated its cooling to the temperature at which life could begin. It has air and water and all that is necessary for the support of animated existence. Yet so vain is man and so blinded by his vanity that no writer up to the very end of the 19th century expressed any idea that intelligent life might have developed there far, or indeed at all, beyond its earthly level. Nor was it generally understood that since Mars is older than our Earth, with scarcely a quarter of the superficial area and remoter from the sun, it necessarily follows that it is not only more distant from time's beginning, but nearer its end. During the opposition of 1894, a great light was seen on the illuminated part of the disk. First at the Lick Observatory, then at Periton of Nice, and then by other observers. English readers heard of it on the first issue of Nature, dated August 2nd. I am inclined to think that this blaze may have been casting of a huge gun in a vast pit sunk into their planet from which their shots were fired at us. Peculiar markings, as yet unexplained, were seen near the site of that outbreak during the next two oppositions. The storm burst upon us six years ago now. As Mars approached opposition, Lavelle of Java set the wires of the astronomical exchange palpitating with the amazing intelligence of a huge outbreak of incandescent gas upon the planet. It had occurred towards the midnight of the 12th, and the spectroscope, to which he had at once resorted, indicated a mass of flaming gas, chiefly hydrogen, moving with an enormous velocity towards the Earth. This jet of fire had become invisible about a quarter past 12, he compared it to a colossal puff of flame suddenly and violently squirted out of the planet as flaming gases rushed out of a gun. A singularly appropriate phrase, it proved. Yet the next day there was nothing of this in the papers except a little note in the Daily Telegraph. 
and the world went in ignorance of one of the gravest dangers that had ever threatened the human race. I might not have heard of the eruption at all had I not met Ogilvy, the well-known astronomer at Ottershaw. He was immensely excited at the news and in excess of his feelings invited me up to take a turn with him that night in a scrutiny of the Red Planet. In spite of all that has happened since, I still remember that vigil very distinctly. The black and silent observatory, the shadowed lantern throwing a feeble glow upon the floor in the corner, the steady ticking of the clockwork in the telescope, the little slit in the roof, an oblong profundity with the stardust streaked across it. Ogilvy moved about, invisible but audible. Looking through his telescope, one saw a circle of deep blue and the little round planet swimming in a field. It seemed such a little thing, so bright and small and still, faintly marked with transverse stripes, and slightly flattened from the perfect round. But so little it was, so silverly warm, a pin's head of light. It was as if it quivered, but really this was the telescope vibrating with the activity of the clockwork that kept the planet in view. As I watched, the planet seemed to grow larger and smaller, and to advance and recede. But that was simply that my eye was tired. Forty millions of miles it was from us. More than forty millions of miles of void. Few people realize the immensity of vacancy in which the dust of the material universe swims. Near it in a field, I remember, were three faint points of light, three telescopic stars infinitely remote, and all around it was the unfathomable darkness of empty space. You know how that blackness looks on a frosty starlit night. In a telescope, it seems far profounder and invisible to me because it was so remote and small, flying swiftly and steadily towards me across that incredible distance, drawing nearer every minute by so many thousands of miles, came the thing they were sending us, the thing that was to bring so much struggle and calamity and death to the earth. I never dreamed of it then as I watched. No one on earth dreamed of that unearing missile. That night, too, there was another jetting out of gas from that distant planet. I saw it. A reddish flash at the edge, the slightest projection of the outline just as the chronometer struck midnight. And at that, I told Ogilvy, and he took my place. That night was warm and I was thirsty, and I went stretching my legs clumsily and feeling my way in the darkness to the little table where the siphon stood, while Ogilvy exclaimed at the streamer of gas that was coming towards us. That night, another invisible missile started on its way to Earth from Mars, just a second or so under 24 hours after the first one. I remember how I sat at the table there in the blackness, with patches of green and crimson swimming before my eyes. I wish I had a light to smoke by, little suspecting the meaning of the minute gleam I had seen and all that it would presently bring me. Ogilvy watched till one and then gave it up, and we lit the lantern and walked over to his house. Down below in the darkness were Ottershaw and Chertsey, and all their hundreds of people sleeping in peace. He was full of speculation that night about the condition of Mars and scoffed at the vulgar idea of its having inhabitants who were signaling us. His idea was that meteorites might have been falling in a heavy shower upon the planet, or that a huge volcanic explosion was in process. He pointed out to me how unlikely it was that organic evolution had taken the same direction in the two adjacent planets. The chances against anything manlike on Mars are a million to one, he said. Hundreds of observers saw the flame that night and the night after about midnight, and again the night after, and so for ten nights a flame each night. Why the shot ceased after the tenth no one on Earth has attempted to explain. It may be the gases of the firing caused the Martians inconvenience. Dense clouds of smoke or dust, visible through a powerful telescope on Earth as a little gray, fluctuating patches, spread through the clearness of the planet's atmosphere and obscured its more familiar features. One night, the first missile then could scarcely have been ten million miles away. I went for a walk with my wife. It was starlight and I explained the signs of the zodiac to her. I pointed out Mars, a bright dot of light creeping zenithward, towards which so many telescopes were pointed. 
It was a warm night. Coming home, a party of excursionists from Chertsey and Isleworth passed us singing and playing music. There were lights on the upper windows of the houses as the people went to bed. From the railway station in the distance came the sound of shunting trains, ringing and rumbling, softened almost to a melody by the distance. My wife pointed out to me the brightness of red, green, and yellow signal lights hanging from the framework against the sky. It seemed so safe and tranquil. 